Hey, how'd you like to come and make a presentation? So <laughs> we jumped on that, and that's why he's here. Just very quickly, um, we're open Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays from noon to four for a tour of the exhibit gallery. Uh, if we have to leave here quickly, we can get out these two exits or through here. You need a restroom, men's rooms, ladies' rooms are right here. Now remember, women and children first. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you all so much, very, very much, honestly, for coming to uh, the presentation on the history of the town of Weefield. I'm Justin Higner, the town of Weefield town historian. And uh, this is uh, not only a history of the town we feel, but it's also a presentation on, but it's also gonna be a time to have a little Q&A back and forth and gather some memories that whatever you happen to remember about what you're seeing, uh, raise, and ha raise your hand, let me know a bit, but as, as things go by, because that's, this is always a kind of back and forth that I do uh, with people whenever I present. So, um, or just sit back and enjoy the fun, either way. So I'm a historian, so that means there are, there are different things, there are different perspectives on this. <laughs> on the top left, it starts. My friends think I'm just doing straight up research. What my mom thinks I do, I'm in a nice quaint little library just minding my own business. This is what society thinks I do is I'm some kind of reenactor who puts on a War of 1812 or colonial thing and stabs the hearts of my enemies. What the university thinks I do is I lecture in front of whole admiring throngs. Hello, there. What I think I do is honestly help every single person who comes and gives every attention and care and so forth. What actually happens, at least in addition to that, is I'm just surrounded by stuff. And I don't even know where to begin on some days because everybody eventually throws everything to me. Um, usually what they don't want. But it's usually what I want, so that's okay. So that's what I actually do. So this is uh, dedicated to my predecessors, chief among them, uh, of course, uh, Charles Cederman, and uh, in particular, John Fercucci, who helped to install the file system and so forth that I use now, essentially. Um, he was a town historian in the mid, mid to late 1990s, and uh, was a good friend to many people in the town. So. Can you make that focus any better? I think that's about as good as I can. I can't read it. Do it. Yeah. Oh, that's okay, because the uh, these words aren't meant to be read. It's just a oh, right. newspaper article. That's all. It doesn't say you know. It's the pick. The line. Yeah. Yeah. The memorial. Yes. Yeah. Is that your room in the garage? And the format's a little odd in this program. Mm -hmm. Is that taken in your in your room in the garage? Nope, that's John for that's John for Yeah, I know that. But is that in your office, or? Oh no, that's actually at Town Hall, um, when he had an office there, oh. and essentially uh, he got moved out of there. And by the time I became a historian, with a historian in between named Walter Bassett, um, he uh, we didn't really have an office anymore. So I had to try to make a new one, and I did. Uh, over at the highway garage, some stuff had already been moved over there, and uh, I just moved everything else over there. Set up a more, much more formalized system, including um, availability for presentations and donations, accession forms. We never had accession forms, really, as far as I know. I established that so that never again would anything disappear. <laughs> so that's the main thing. Not without us having something to say. This is ours, you know. Okay, so. So in the beginning, uh, and I do mean the beginning practically, uh, about uh, 12,000 years ago, geologists and naturalists and the local sciences tell us that this area was continuously covered, plowed, and scoured through by glaciers and successive ice ages. The depressions made by these processes over 100,000 plus years turned low valleys into basins out of which the Great Lakes, or seas really, emerged. There are also associated lakes that are overflow areas that no longer exist, like Bloody Run Creek and so forth. Most of the town lies within one of these smaller basins, Lake Tonawanda. Most of the town was then 15 to 25 feet underwater. And so, and so you see on this map above, we see it, where our logo is right there, our seal, is roughly where the town of Weefield is today. 
This is the Niagara River that flows through today between modern day Canada and the United States and New York. Uh, a lot of Buffalo was on a, on a plateau basically right where actually where Buffalo General Hospital is now. It's on a kind of rise actually in a city. That would have been above the waters around it. We're talking 20 to 30 feet deep in some cases and even shallower at 10 feet or so depending on where on this huge overflow lake that you, that you were in. Here's Lake Erie at the time and here's Lake Ontario. Geologists call this though Lake Iroquois essentially to differentiate it from the current boundaries of Lake Ontario, for example. And we are sitting in a part of Niagara County that was virtually underwater of this lake. Now, just east of this, besides the future Niagara River, which already had a waterfall there by about 12,000 or so years ago, at Lewiston, the town and village of Lewiston, where that is now, about 40 feet high, just a little thing really compared to what it is now, you go further east and there are six or seven other waterfalls going all the way to modern Rochester. And these all were outlets for the massive amounts of water that had overwhelmed the Great Lakes Basin and was coming through this funnel in this area. And even earlier it came through another part of Canada, the Niagara Peninsula, further up in there. Uh, that was another outlet for a thousand years or so. A delta. Hmm? A delta, yes. Basically, yes, a delta, right. And this was an extensive delta that existed roughly in this form before basically retreating and drying up and going back and reducing itself until about uh, five or 8,000 years ago. And some of this lake uh, still exists today in the form of Bond Lake Park. A few of the lakes in there um, are natural lakes. The other ones, the West and East Myers lakes in particular within that park are quarries. They were quarries way back when they became lakes later on. So that's what was there. Wasn't Bond Lake a quarry? Bond Lake itself was not a quarry. It is a, is a natural lake that was scoured out more, from what I'm told, to help provide for the lifting and modification of streets that were going through that area up until about the 1920s. So they were kind of scoured or dug up, but they weren't quarries, strictly speaking. The West and East Myers Lakes were quarries back in the day, and actually, you can find some of that stonework if you happen to go up to the old stone towers where the Omega sculpture is over at Art Park there on the uh, halfway up the escarpment. The rock that those stone towers are made from has the same strata, the same fossilization, the same everything, and those most likely came right out of what's now Bond Lake Park or the Burnmaster County Park and out of that quarry. They virtually match up, so we have some other sources too that basically confirm that. All That's of this. Still a part of Wheatfield? Hmm? That's still a part of Wheatfield, Bond Lake? Bond Lake Park is within uh, the town of Lewiston. Oh, Lewiston. Actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah, up in there, right next to and kind of into the Tuscarora Nation. The lines actually kind of blur there, which is a whole other story for another time. Um, this is also the reason why there is so much clay in the subsoils around us. This clay is post-glacial silt and deposits brought up from the southwest flow. Just to the north, northeast of the town, there were several waterfalls and rapids raging over various branches, as I've just mentioned. The Lewiston branch would later form the famous Niagara Falls, which runs today. Humans started to arrive in this area by about 8,000 BC. So we then arrive to the time, eventually, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, they are a historically powerful Northeast Native American Confederacy. It began in 1000 AD uh, via the Peacemaker and other figures who helped to unite various nations, which were then five and then later six nations and has been held together through a combination of tributes, condolences, and the great law of peace. The capitals within the Onondaga Nation Longhouse community and center. This unique assembly had contacts with several other civilizations, including the ancient Cahokia peoples in the Mississippi River region, as well as Mesoamerican societies. So there was a broader, greater network here of not just many, many tribes and different peoples uh, that were very different from each other in many ways, but the trade networks were extensive. And we now believe that uh, the mound builders of the Mississippian cultures did actually have a great deal of contact with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And that some of the mound building practices and, grave and other rituals um, would have related back and forth between them at some point. 
They were known during the colonial years to the French as the Iroquois League, and later as the Iroquois Confederacy, and to the English as the Five Nations, comprising Mohawk, Onondaga, Oneida, Cayuga, and the Seneca. And we have a illustration of a typical longhouse, and these were arranged in several communities, almost in a spoke-like kind of pattern. And so it was a sort of rough way to organize them and create a center around which communal fires would be held. Now this includes uh, the Tuscarora. After 1722, they accepted the Tuscarora people from the southeast into from the uh, southeast United States, I should say, uh, future United States, into their confederacy and became known as the Six Nations. The Iroquois had absorbed or eliminated other peoples into their tribes, such as the Neuter uh, tribe in the 1650s by modern-day Cuyahoga Island. And as a result of warfare adoption of captives and by offering shelter to displaced peoples. So this confederacy officially grew and, and crystallized into the form that we still recognize now, uh, officially, according to the laws there. Culturally, all are considered members of the clan, of clans and tribes into which they are adopted by families. In 2010, more than 45,000 enrolled Six Nations peoples lived in Canada and about 80,000 in the United States. It, the whole thing still exists today and by treaty. Arrowheads and tomahawks have been found in the Summit Mall area. Luther Street and the Mole Farm slash the Town Hall area were by Church Road, essentially off Niagara Falls Boulevard, and Sylvian Street and modern day Niagara Road. And that actually, Niagara Road right there through the village of Burkholz was once a native trail. And this text you're not meant to really read, obviously. Uh, this is basically showing the map, the length and breadth of the core of the Confederacy. Not necessarily its full um, influential scope, but just really where the core of these nations essentially were. The Tuscaroras are a little, are a little brother clan, and they would have been adopted by the Senecas, and then the Senecas provided them the space and the integrity for themselves in the area, of course, where Lewison is now. Some people, such as uh, Benjamin Franklin and others afterwards, who observed various um, council fires and so forth in Oneida, and since then have assumed that a great deal of American democracy was based off of the rituals and the condolences, essentially, of the uh, Confederacy. That is not quite accurate. What we have is a winner-take-all system or a, or a majority rules system. Not the same for them. Their form of governments was of a Confederacy, but within the organizational structure in the middle, it was a government by consensus, essentially. And so that is what Benjamin Franklin was essentially talking about, that everybody in the room is accounted for when making decisions, and that the men in the center of the room representing different tribes and clans, they would be backed up and checked by the clan mothers who sat behind them <coughs> in the same space. So nothing would really be decided unless there was a consensus by a kind of prime minister or the Tanadaho. And he is elected for just one year, basically, and he's just a facilitator, even. So it's not strictly a hierarchical thing. They became more like that. The current system within the Six Nations became more hierarchical and more federal because they had to sort of have an answer to the white man's form of government. So that's, that's how that's changed over the years. What role did the clan women have? Clan women represent uh, the 45 families, 40, 45, 48 families of the Confederacy. These are families attached to various uh, clans and, and beyond that, the tribe, essentially. And the tribe is a whole other complicated you know, situation. It's all complicated, of course, when you get into that sort of a system. But the point of mentioning this is that you have a very different style of government and a style of relationship to that government. It is a consensual <coughs> situation. And, it, and I would say that the government became more clearly defined and more and much more, again, hierarchical um, and solidified once they had another system to have to try to deal with. And so that's the tribe system that exists today, the chief and clan system today, different than when they, eventually, when they uh, originally started. So this is uh, also the location, roughly, where the Le Guiffin was constructed. This was uh, the first Great Lakes ship. This is the first uh, vessel built by uh, the uh, white settlers, by the French in particular. 
And Le Griffon uh, was a sailing vessel actually built by René Robert Cavalier, Cé de la Salle. I'm going to try to say that exactly. In 1679, in his quest to explore the little river at the time, it was called the Niagara, uh, or eventually the Niagara, the yet unidentified Great Lakes area and the Northwest Passage to China and Japan. It was hoped that the Great Lakes would actually open out into the Pacific Ocean and therefore get a passage out east. And yeah, that's not quite how that worked. It was constructed and launched at or near the Cayuga Creek on the Niagara River in the Griffin Park area, the exact location is unknown, and was armed with several cannon. The exact size and construction of the Griffin is not known, but many researchers believe that she was a 45-ton bark. She was the largest sailing vessel on the Great Lakes up to that time. La Salle disembarked and on 18th of September sent the ship back toward Niagara on its return trip from the island said to be located in the mouth of the body of water which is now known as Green Bay. It vanished with all six crew members and its load of furs. Fur was a major component and supporting trade for the French presence in this area. Father Hennepin wrote that the Griffin was lost in a violent storm and has still not been located officially yet. So that's an illustration of the North American continent as the British and the French uh, war, the Indian War essentially in the 1750s. This is the understanding of North America essentially at this time. Uh, you may not be able to see too good a detail back there, but you can kind of see the rudimentary nature of how how alien the West really was yet. And the East was still very much an alien area. The Appalachian area hadn't really been explored yet, let alone anything else. You can even see California, future California, is, is basically on an island, when actually that's the, the rumored Rio Grande. They didn't know how big it was, so they assumed that all the West was one island <laughs> in here. And they realized, oh, it's just Baja California, going into next to Mexico, and that was the island so forth. This is Father Hennepin and that is LaSalle. Is the stone still down there from LaSalle? From LaSalle stone between mm -hmm. the river road and the river? Or the little river, I should say? The LaSalle stone? Like yeah. the commemorative? Yeah. Yes, that is still there. Okay. Yeah. And but the plaque has been replaced at least once because, well, Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but also because of the fact that for many years in the mid-century, a lot of plaques were popped off all over the place. And so, you know, even at Fairmont Park, Fairmount Park in the town of Weefield there, uh, the plaque near the original dedication uh, flagpole there was popped off, presumably just a few years after it was put in. And this was a phenomenon that was happening all over the place, scrap, basically, just scrap metal. And so slowly those have been replaced with newer, newer devices. So what was going on in Weefield during the War of 1812? Well, George Berger uh, was the first known person to have settled in the area, uh, first now known as Weefield, then Cambria. It was part of the first community in this area, founded in 1808. Uh, that was the first uh, official municipality on uh, what was then the new uh, county of Niagara, and built a long house along, a log house, I should say, along the Niagara River. We feel was essentially untouched during the War of 1812, save for the possible destruction of Berger's home, as well as they marched through for the both, both the American and British forces heading to or from the Upper Niagara and Buffalo regions, the, and, Black, and Black Rock regions. The uh, few residents there fled eastwards with almost everyone else. So what there was of, you know, settlers here, they fled like everybody else. Very few returned, essentially. This area may have also served as a temporary refuge place for displaced locals from the burned settlements. So several people out of Lewiston, for example, or Buffalo, may have come up, up to this area first and then start heading east to get away. We feel really started to uh, form toward the 1830s, but I'll go back a little bit to the 1780s here when Robert, Mo Robert Morris and other financiers uh, purchased seven, sorry, 3.7 million acres under the Holland Land Company. Some of the area in that purchase was known then as the Transit Line or Transit Road and included the latter day North Tondawanda, Cambria, and the town of Weefield. Eventually, these included numbered subdivisions, including the Mile Strip area, which was enhanced as part of as part punishment on the local native inhabitants for a labor dispute regarding the portage route. That is to say, 
the carrying and cargo run uh, foot traffic along the riverway right there. It was literally a labor dispute. It was probably the first of its kind on this continent, actually. <laughs> and uh, to restrict access to and to restrict access just to white settlers for military purposes and so forth. So they established that mile strip, that, that mile away from the river on either side to make sure that native peoples would not interfere with that portage or any other economic or activity to follow that was baked into the Holland land plans as well. Um, Nyer County was established in 1808 and included modern Erie County. All the area north of Tonawanda was called the town of Cambria. In 1821, the southern sector was renamed Erie County and retained <coughs> Buffalo as its county seat, while Nyer County retained its name but soon sat in Lockport. Many investors like Timothy Shaw, Harvey Miller, John Gray, uh, actually, and the, there's a couple of names missing here be, uh, because, again, this is a slightly different presentation, Benjamin Franklin McNitt. Now, Benjamin, I have to pause on that name because Benjamin Franklin McNitt's resting place is known and is even marked uh, very well at this point uh, with a, a flag holder and so forth just to help promote that, that little cemetery that he's in right now. It's the McNitt Warden Cemetery, and that exists in the north eastern area of town, and uh, it was part of a development that's ongoing up there, but long story short, it's it's a little cemetery with a huge amount of history, and it's probably the oldest in town was then Cambria when they settled there um, in the 18, uh, 1815 period, and Benjamin Franklin McNitt was actually our second town supervisor in 1837, one term, and he died in 1848. Uh, he was also a War of 1812 veteran, and he's the only known War of 1812 veteran buried in the borders of modern wheat fields. So uh, there may be more. I'm sure there might be several more, uh, in fact, but we, you know, how cemeteries are, you end up losing a lot of records over time. Uh, well, they, along with uh, Volney Spalding, purchased parcels in this area for $5 an acre, where Mapleton and Lockport roads across Shawnee Road are. Miller brought uh, and bought acreage Lockport and uh, Bear Road. So that's where that started to settle right there. In 1828, Timothy Shaw of the Shawnee Hamlet, along with Spalding, set up a grocery and ashery in that area. The Ward Cemetery was established in 1818 on Lockport Road near Ward Road and is one of the county's oldest, containing an estimated 300 graves, although you would never guess it today because so many stones are missing. Shawnee was the first community in our town to be established and it is said that it was named for Shaw who limped from a bad knee. Shaw with a bad knee, hence Shawnee. Mm. <laughs> and I think this is a, a favorite tale of North Tonawanda too anyways and uh, um, that may be apocryphal actually on its own. So this is a couple of maps drawn up by, uh, let's see, uh, 1800. When you mentioned Bear Road, Mm -hmm. Um, I own the house that's right off Lockport Road, the first big house built in 18, 1824, and Louie and Olive Bear, Louie was my ex-father-in-law's cousin, oh, and wow. my house was built in 1824, and when we bought it, my ex-husband and I bought it in 87, and it's a lot of work. <laughs> oh, absolutely. A lot of work, but it's, we've tried to keep as much original as we can and um i'm in the process now i just just got a roof put on it and i'm in the process of i want to try to get it painted i'm going to do the the front entrance way uh the, the around the front door the wood's all rotted away and i got one guy that somebody recommended that's going to try to if you if he's going to do it i don't know but it's rebuild the woodwork around <coughs> it more like how it originally was and that's perfect. Yeah, yeah that, we're that, trying yeah. to get to you know, look at like how it was. We and brought it away for 30 or 20 years. You you bring up something too, which is uh, not only your house, but uh, there's at least one other in town that will be celebrating its 200th birthday between the year that you described yeah. and at least 1826. So there's uh, two or three houses that will actually be turning 200, including yours. So yeah, yeah. I'll have to come by, of course, yeah, with my camera and, you know, Invade for a bit and <laughs> go around. <laughs> well, my mother, God rest her soul, yeah. removed about six layers of lead paint from my oh. front living room windows. 
the front lobby we live through when windows are all well, but the cars work, they're beautiful. Oh, that's The rest we did, you know, new and replaced everything, but the front windows in the living room, it's a lot of work. Especially did it. The original studs were barn trees. Yeah, the original studs in the front living room, we knocked down walls, were trees. Oh, wow. They that's just nice. took, they were the park. Right, right yeah, trees. There exactly, trees. yeah. Yeah, we replaced it, but the front living room were trees. It has to be remembered. Um, and I should and I should say that these maps date from eighteen uh, seventies and nineteen hundred. Right behind the print shop. Oh, well, yeah. Mays was next to there. May yeah. May Estate was on Lockport Road near Bear Road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my my sister-in-law, uh, Jane Coyman, had a house on Bear Road. You're right on the corner. Right on the corner, yeah, right behind the print shop, yeah. Oh, perfect, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll be looking that up soon for sure. And my, and you mentioned something also about the, uh, the wood handling yeah, process. Yeah. Going further back and outside of certain methods of construction, whole logs would be used essentially. I mean, that's what yeah. you had to do and you had to do it quickly depending on what time of the year you were arriving. When we go into the Burkholz culture for a moment, uh, we're gonna see different methods of how they built because they're bringing, you know, crafting right out of the old country and into this land, which is very familiar to them, you know, with the climate, but their methods of construction would be very different than even uh, people coming back from the War of 1812 back into what's gonna be the antebellum period. Uh, for us here. Um, as I said, these two maps, uh, the one on the left is from the 1870s and the one on the right is actually from 1900. So we feel during 1827 through 1833, the Pennsylvania Germans and Mennonites established farms along Lockport Road in this area now known as Walmore in, in the 1830s. Actually, their spelling would have been Walmau to, to start with and the Walmore Inn and Bar was built in 1839 as the rest stop for those traveling between Lockport area and Niagara Falls, which was then known as the village of Manchester. Daniel Treichler and his family settled on, on the southwest portion of Ward Road and Lockport Road. Other families include the Schenck, who built a sawmill, Kraut, Stock, Roberts, Ward, and Hallbecker. N. M. Ward was a farmer, just like McNitt was when he wasn't land speculating and making money there as well. Um, and essentially, farmers were also the first supervisors of the town. Um, it was a pretty informal thing when they first got together. We'll see the actual building where they first met. Martin Bush's old farm sat on the current Bell plant site, meanwhile. So that was one huge farm, and eventually it slowly broke up into a few other farms out of which come the factory, and we'll see that toward the end. So pockets of unsold land was purchased by the Albany Land Company of Lockport. In 1833, Washington Hunt of Hunt Street uh, fame over there, and Henry Walbridge in turn purchased 32,000 acres that were left over in the Albany Land Purchase. So basically whatever wasn't gotten at that point, they uh, snapped up. Purchasers also included the aforementioned uh, Mr. McNitt, uh, John Wilkins Jr. and Samuel Warden, all in the 1830s. The creation of the Erie Canal in the early 1800s made this heavily wooded and mostly uninhabited area more attractive to settlement and commerce. A small part of the southeast border sits on the Erie Canal to this day, or should I say the Erie Canal Way, because we're talking about Tonawanda Creek, essentially, and that was part of the Erie Canal system. So they didn't dig through the town, uh, but, you know, I, you know or what would be the future town of Wheatfield, but the Canal Way uh, was, was already there. And that is now your county as it all shook out. And of course, most of you, all of you I should say, are familiar with these borders as, as, as it became. Wheatfield was actually the last municipality to be formed in 1836 when it was founded. And so um, that completes the map essentially as it is today. And we became a town, as I said, in 1836. They derive, the name itself derives from commentaries, which include the fact that the town was known as an excellent place for growing wheat. Currently, there are no wheat farms. You know, I looked around for a while, and no, no current wheat farms at the moment. In May of 1836, in particular, a board of trustees met in the number nine one-room schoolhouse, which, like many 
uh, such schoolhouses doubled as community centers and courts to found the town of Niagara and Cambria partnerships and townships. N. M. Ward was the first supervisor. Another man, Louis Payne, uh, Payne Avenue fame, of uh, North Tonawana would be another supervisor in 1847. Stanley Brzezinski eventually would have the longest term in office from 18, from 1958 to 1979, um, and we feel, as I said, was the last one to be founded. This is the actual, um, I guess that was not included in there. Okay, so these are different events that, oh, here actually, I'll pass this around. This is the actual schoolhouse that our founders met in, essentially. And the, the schoolhouse itself uh, was built in around 1830, essentially. And this schoolhouse existed on the uh, north, uh, northeast portion, the northeast corner of Lockport and Hoover Roads up in there. There's a modern ranch house that stands there right now. And uh, that building was gone by 1967. Or so. Number seven. Yeah, the number seven schoolhouse. That, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the one we were talking about the other day, and uh, that's that's that, that's a particular interest right now. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and that building um, is caught in an old assessor's picture. So that's a tax assessor's picture right there. So in case you're curious about the numbers that run along the bottom of it, that's the lot's SBL number, not the address, but the SBL number. So in 18, I'm just going to read these off. Coincidentally, in 1836, there are 24 stars in the flag of the United States, with the 25th added uh, in that year, Arkansas. William IV was king of Great Britain, and slavery had only just been abolished in the empire as a whole three years earlier. Only a few veterans of the American Revolution were still alive at this point. Simon Kenton, American frontiersman, a revolutionary militia general, uh, dies in this year. And he was born in 1755. Andrew Jackson was only the seventh president of the United States. William L. Macy was the New York State governor. The Texas Revolution and, and independence struggle occurred during the siege of the Alamo. Also in 1836, the first numbered U.S. patent, number one, after filing 9,957 unnumbered patents, is, is uh, granted to John Ruggles for improvements to railroad steam locomotive tires. The office itself burned uh, just two months later. The United States presidential election 1836 occurred with Martin Van Buren defeating William Henry Harrison and three other Whig candidates. Ex-King Charles X of France dies. He was overthrown actually a few years earlier in 1830 and over there, and uh, July Revolution, touched the clouds. A Native American chieftain from the Tenton Lakota Sioux was born in this year. He died in 1905. The last tract of tagged land in western New York was sold by the original Holland Land Company in this year. They were out of Batavia, New York. Afterwards, the registry was closed forever. By the mid-1800s, the Prussian Kingdom had placed restrictions on old Lutheran congregations with the reformed uh, church regulations, which included ins intrusions on employment, educational, and civic opportunities. As a result, many Germans, particularly from the Uckermark region of eastern Germany, emigrated to the United States. 800 people came through the Erie Canal via Buffalo and settled on 